I'm going to go to a, a presentation of a, mostly my photos, but I'm also going to have a lot of a few other photos that other people have given me to kind of illustrate things and some maps and a couple of three things. Clay, unmute yourself. Okay, so I am unmuted now. <laughs> okay, you ready for me to start? Yes. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, you need to hear me though. I need to be able to talk. We can hear you. Oh, okay. All right. All right, let me uh, see. I need to do something here then. <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have it set at the beginning. Pardon me. Let me uh, get out of this and get back to the beginning of my slides. Sorry. Oh, come on. Uh, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm going to just scroll real quick to get back to the beginning. I don't know. I didn't, I, I didn't have it set at the beginning. So here's the beginning of my slides. And uh, so we uh, go here. And the title she's given me are as uh, Iceland, Land of Fire and Ice. And why is that title there and how appropriate is it? So let's just look at a little bit of that. Yes, the fire is volcanoes. And every so often there are some eruptions. They're not as big as things like Mount Helens most of the time. Once in a while there's a biggie, and we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But there are actually uh, around 130 active volcanoes likely to open at any time. So, me, I'm sorry. Uh, and the other ice part, the fire and ice, of course, is the glaciers. So, uh, right now the glaciers cover about... 10% of the country. This is a uh, satellite view of, of Iceland. And you'll notice one rather large cluster of, acre, of uh, glaciers here, and that's about it. But while we've got this uh, map on, I would like for you to notice a couple of other things. There's a little thing right down here that's hardly visible. And there's another little one way up here that's hardly visible. There are offshore islands here and there because some of the volcanoes that pop up are not on the mainland. They're on the, uh, on the outside. Okay. Oh, why am I? So Iceland is uh, kind of a modern city as far as Reykjavik, the capital is concerned. Uh, this is a photo that was made in 2002, uh, and here is a more recent photo of Iceland, uh, of Reykjavik. About 40% uh, percent of the population of Iceland live in uh, Reykjavik. Uh, Iceland is not heavily populated. There's about uh, almost 40,000 people, which odd, uh, I'm sorry, almost 130,000 people as, uh, in Iceland. And uh, the country itself is about the size of Virginia. So comparing it to Virginia, we're, the actual square miles are about the same. But it's a very modern city. This is a church uh, in downtown, it's, and it's rather very modern architecture, the unusual. But this, these structures that you see here are structures to, to uh, mimic the, uh, what do we call it? Um, the, the, I'm thinking, I'm forgetting the word for, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for those uh, structures, sorry. Uh, anyway, inside the church is like this, and uh, they have some modern things. One of the most modern things is this building here, which was built uh, after, the, after I was there in 2007, so I'm not sure exactly what it is. This is the concert hall, and if you'll, uh, it's, a, it's such a very unusual building. It, I'm sorry, for some reason my device is not... Okay, oh, sorry. 
This is inside the uh, concert hall, and uh, this is just one of the entrances where you go up to, to get up to the side entrance. But it's a very, very uh, famous place. Uh, <coughs> volcanoes. There are, as they say there's about 130 active volcanoes. They don't always erupt, or erupt very often. Uh, and I never was there to see one of them erupt. So anything you see with an eruption uh, was something that uh, uh, that came from, um, for some reason I'm having difficulty uh, scrolling. So this was a photo from somewhere else. But uh, the thing, oops, goodness, pardon me. In 2010, there was an eruption underneath one of the large glaciers. And it didn't shoot fire up, instead it shot up, shot up this cloud of dust and particles. And it happened to be on the southeast coast of Iceland and the wind was blowing out to ocean. So Iceland didn't get a lot of it, but it blew all over Europe. And of course it made the headlines because it shut down the airlines flights over Europe for about a week. And so that was 2010. And that allowed us to do something else. To, to, uh, we had a tours now uh, by Bjorn Rurikson. And the volcanoes uh, that you see more nowadays are, are happening the uh, just breaks in the ridges. They, they pop up like this. And this happens to be a book that's put out by Mr. Bjorn Rorikson, who uh, was the guide on all of the tours that I've been on. He has several uh, volumes called Iceland from Above, Aircraft Photos. And uh, <clears throat> he calls this one his lobster. So he calls it his lobster. And Bjorn's going to be leading a hopefully another tour, which was supposed to be this year, but right now it's been postponed because of the virus problem until next year. And uh, hope that right now the Senior Center is sponsoring this tour. There are only four reservations left, so if you're interested in going, you do have to plan ahead because uh, it's limited to approximately 20 people. And uh, there are four openings left right now. Other people have already joined in. Oh, I don't know why my screen is not <laughs> advancing like it should. <laughs> okay. I want to show you that this old, another map just to give you an appreciation of two or three things. Iceland is located in the up in the North Atlantic off of Greenland uh, and it's about a five hour flight from New York to Iceland. Uh, time wise they're four to five hours uh, difference from us depending on what time whether daylight savings etc. But you'll notice it's a part of the Atlantic Ocean. And actually, uh, uh, two things about this geography. First of all, there is a mid-Atlantic ridge that goes up through here and it goes right up through Iceland. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. The other thing is the Gulf Stream flows from the Gulf of Mexico up this way, bathes the south coast of Iceland and goes over even as far as, as Europe. Okay, so there is this mid-Atlantic ridge which I just uh, picked up a, a little graph to show you how it goes right down through the middle of Iceland. Uh, the Eurasian or Europe plate is to the right and the North American plate to the left. And there are several volcanoes on that, but that's, they're not restricted to that particular ridge because the entire area is setting on top of a, of a magma that's not too far down. And uh, there are even new ice, new um, islands being formed small off the coast that are uninhabited uh, in the last few years. There was one rather large one down off the south coast. Along that mid-Atlantic ridge, this was about uh, four years ago before the uh, crisis of the, the virus hit us. And uh, it was very, the tourists really grew. Before, around 2002, uh, when I was there, the tourists weren't very thick and very heavy. Wasn't that many. Same way in 2007. When I was back in 2016, after that 2010 volcano uh, called the Iceland to people's attention all over the world, the tourism really expanded. 
with a population of about uh, 325,000 people, they had at last year two million visitors. And uh, so this was a scene uh, then back about four years ago. First time I was there, I happened to be walking along at the head of our group, and this was what I saw. Same kind of area. But it's uh, that there are different places where the land fractures as the plates subside and as they grow and so forth. And uh, this is a lot, a lot of the structure that we see. Now, I didn't get there in the winter. This is a winter scene in, on that same area that I pulled off of the uh, internet because I wanted to mention that winter on the south coast is really not that bad. It gets down around, you know, freezing and once in a while below freezing. It's more of a drizzly, uh, cloudy type of, uh, type of weather. So that's it. And that's because of that Gulf Stream that we mentioned. And I don't know, just, okay. Uh, offshore on the south side of Iceland, seven miles offshore is an island. It's called, uh, it's, it's called the west part of the Westman Islands. And it's Heme, or it's the name of it. But there was a very large eruption on this island in 1973. And it wasn't a big blast, but it opened up and started uh, lava flowing out and it flowed for about almost six months. And it actually uh, covered the houses of half of the people that lived there at that time. Now on this map, since that time, they have built out the city in this area. But this entire area that you see here was part of this uh, a volcano, which was in this area, and it uh, it it actually uh, covered half of the town. Nobody was hurt. They, it, it it erupted and started flowing, and the people were all able to get out. No one was hurt, and so forth in the thing. But it was a very unusual thing. You'll notice another offshore island here, and there are several others around this island. You get to it on a ferry. There's the ferry line coming in. And this is a fishing, a harbor. And when the volcano went off and this lava started flowing, it was going to close this channel off, which would block all of the fishermen because this, this is a fishing harbor here. But the United States government and lots of other people brought in boats with uh, hoses that were shooting water up, they piped water in, and they kept pouring water on the lava, and they were actually able to stop it from flowing. So, so this is a more recent picture, and now there are some uh, streets up through the lava, but this was all lava flow here, and it was very interesting. Uh, and my wife and I hiked up on that uh, volcano in 2002, and this is what it looked like then. But Here's where the lava flow almost blocked the harbor, but now that's the way it is now. Another view, just how it crushed over this water tank. And this was where they were, on the, they were doing a uh, archaeological dig, because here's the, the volcanic, and it started growing grass up here, but look how that much lava covered down. This was a house. And uh, around the island, uh, the water, uh, the waves and so forth, occasionally eat in it. I, I, we were able to take on one time a small boat and went up in this cave and uh, underneath, around, underneath the island. These are called lava bombs. Lava bombs are when the, there was, the lava was shooting up into the air, molten. It cools down enough that it cools like a drop of water, but look at the size of those lava bombs. And that's a characteristic of volcanoes uh, in many places around the world. But also over on the mainland, many, many places there are these fumaroles. Now this is a, an extinct one, that is, it's not blowing now, but you'll notice around the countryside that there are just several of these have erupted. And here and there, uh, they are still active, like this one, which is f f uh, steam coming out of it and so forth. And this is very, and a whole area up in the north, north central, almost northwest Iceland. And that whole area is very much like Yellowstone. 
And so you've got these places where the lava, the, where it's flowed up and looks like this, and this is one where it's cool and so forth. So it's a very interesting area, and the tour is free. Usually, at the, uh, will, it's, it's planned to go to this area if you take the uh, tour next year. This is uh, a view out over the original place of a glacier, of a uh, geyser. The word geyser, G-E-Y-S-I-R, is a uh, word from Iceland. The original geyser was right over here. It's mostly inactive now. Uh, once in a while, it's still full of bows. But just about a, oh, maybe a football field distance away is another one, which nowadays still uh, erupts about every seven to 10 minutes or so. And I've stood there and watch the water kind of bubble because uh, as and you, when, and you never know when it's going to actually blow the plumes get up to about 60 feet high uh, when they do and uh, people are always like like i was just, uh, standing around getting our pictures of it so the geyser uh, the original word geyser is from uh, icelandic uh, and it just means gush i think is the word that, that it means okay Waterfalls. There are many, many huge waterfalls in Iceland. And most of the big ones, of course, are flowing out from underneath the glaciers because the glaciers are standing on this mantle of the earth that's not that far from the lava down below and the molten lava and the heat. So there are continual flows out of the glaciers several different places around the, uh, Iceland. And so here are some of the uh, glaciers and so forth, or the, ice, the waterfalls. If you want to get an idea how big this one is, look at the folks over here on the, on the ledge. And some of them are inland. And this is one of them that's uh, very handy. It's very close to what's called the ring road that we'll talk about a little bit more because this one you can actually walk up behind. Uh, underneath this photo I made in 2000 either two or seven I don't remember I think it was 2007 and there were a few people there and uh, I was there twice with my wife and uh, we got back up under the falls shooting out into the countryside and this is uh, my wife back on the, uh, the trail this goes behind there and another view out underneath the water coming down <clears throat> And some other waterfalls around Iceland. Uh, so again, uh, oh, there's uh, our friend Pete Cross, who uh, was, who along with Bjorn Rurikson was a guide on all three of the tours that I went on, and they have been actually conducting such tours back into the uh, 1900s. So they're both both very knowledgeable of the area and wonderful guides. You will never have a tour run by anybody else as well. Really, Bjorn did most of the talking, and he is a phenomenal person. He is, he, he's a geologist, he's a linguist, he a, was a pilot, he's a photographer, and he's uh, multilingual, and he's, he uh, will give you a guided tour that's like no other tour. My wife and I took many tours uh, th here and there, and we never had anybody even close to to the uh, ones that Bjorn Rorikson did. Oh. <clears throat> another water, another waterfall. And glaciers, 10% or so of the country, maybe not quite that. This is the way you usually will see the glaciers. You're driving along the road and the inland is uh, all this volcanic area and glaciers will be flowing down. And of course, those of, you, those of you that are familiar with glaciers, you know they actually flow. They flow the ice very slowly. They scoot down between the rocks. They grind up the rocks so that there's a, a lot of gr ground up black lava, which is on the top of the glaciers. And they're usually not nice and pretty crystal, crystal clear. Instead, they're more uh, dirty and uh, black and so forth. This is the largest uh, glacier and how it's the, you're able to view it from the, from the road. 
And this glacier covers several square miles and is actually, I don't know, somewhere more than a mile deep, some places I understand. I did, didn't look it up. But anyway, that's the biggest one. But some of the glaciers come down to the ocean, and this one is uh, very nicely on the main road again. Uh, it's a, a, a glacial lagoon with all of these icebergs that are breaking off. It's about uh, one square mile in size. And you can go out in the lagoon in one of these duck vehicles. When we were there in 2002 and 2007, there were three of these vehicles. Uh, when I was there in 2016, for some reason there was only two of them and they were getting to look a little dilapidated. So I don't know if they're still running or not. The last word I think is they, there may be one or more run, still, still running and it will be on the tour if, you, uh, if it's still going. But the, and, and then once you go out in the, in the, uh, in the two, there were two uh, in this one. This is one across from me. I was on one. And uh, it just takes you out amongst the glaciers, up close to the face of the, uh, of the glacier itself. And uh, in this case, uh, one of, he chipped off some ice that uh, he said could be a, uh, from a snowfall a thousand years ago. And it laid down beneath and was pressed down into this nice crystal clear. And he chipped it off so you could suck on a little ice cube from a uh, hundred or thousand years ago. And most of you who are familiar uh, with icebergs, you know that only 10% of them is above water. There's another 90% of the, of the down below the water where they're floating. They flow from the face of the glacier, which is right here in this picture. And they flow for about a mile very slowly out underneath this bridge. Uh, they're coming from that direction to, to, toward us. And uh, then well, behind me is this scene on the beach. Tide is partly out, so some of the uh, glaciers, are the icebergs are setting up on the shore on the black sand. And, uh, <clears throat> and as this is, was a, about 8 o'clock in the evening, looking towards the east with uh, no sun hardly, but the bright sun would have been behind us. Along the shore, on the whole south shore, uh, there are many large cliffs and so forth overhang. This is the southernmost city in Iceland. It's called Vik, V-I-K. Uh, this photograph was made by Bjorn Rurikson because I didn't get up on the hill like that. I took some from down in the town, but uh, his photo was so much better. It just shows the very southernmost village uh, along the south shore. Along the shore, uh, there are places like this where the waves come in, uh, particularly when it's high tide and there's storms. They really get violent and wash up in here and uh, wash, wash out small caves amongst the, uh, amongst the, the, uh, the cliffs. But then many of the beaches are more like this. And this is a photo I made with just an iPhone uh, 6 camera. And the dark, uh, the sea surf bouncing, blowing in, and so forth. The dark sand, the black sand uh, of the volcanoes. Many of the shore of uh, the Iceland has these the fjords and the long peninsulas that go out, and so some, most of the cliffs and so forth are washed away like this. Uh, so let's talk about that ring road, along the road. And let's look at this map again. And this time I've done a little bit more. I have one that actually has the ring road on it going around. The ring road is about uh, just under 900 miles if you don't take any of the side trips. Uh, and uh, when I was there in 2002, the road didn't go all the way down across here because this is the, that large volcanic collection of volcan of, of uh, volcanoes underneath the uh, uh, underneath the ice and when they have an eruption under there sometimes they erupt and they don't burst through or anything they pull up a huge lake of melted ice and, and water underneath it and then suddenly it breaks loose into an outward gush that covers this whole area and just what would wash out any road 
So the first time I was there, there was no road there. The next time I was there, there was a road there. The next time I was there, it had been washed out, I think, well, at least once, and I think maybe twice in between my visits, uh, because it, the, 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 um, the flow is just so strong, and it goes for almost uh, a, a length of about 30 miles that's there. And so uh, while I'm at it, let me point out a couple of other things. One other offshore island up here on the north has a very small village on it, uh, and it is they happens to be just above the Arctic Circle. The Arctic Circle doesn't touch mainland, but it does touch the island of Grimsey up here at the top. And this is the island that I showed you where the volcano was before. And uh, Reykjavik is around in this area, about 30 miles away to the south. Uh, it, 35 is the airport that you fly in, that you go into, uh, Keflavik Airport, which actually was a, started as a United States Air Force base in World War II and was turned over to Iceland as their international airport uh, rather than a smaller one, which still has local planes flying out of Reykjavik to some of the small airports around Iceland. Here's some of that outflow type. It just washes out across the land and it, uh, it and then leaves uh, the black sand and uh, so forth in it. This is a photo made. I was on the on the on the newer bridge, but uh, going on Ring Road. But uh, in order to uh, make things more permanent, they were building a new bridge, which is supposed to be now strong enough to withstand another ice, another outflow and not have the road wash out. So that was under construction. By the way, this photograph and several others I made from the bus on the road with an iPad. I had my iPad setting up the window of the bus. The bus was going about 45 miles an hour. And uh, with your uh, with all of the Apple devices, whenever you, if you to flip the shutter, if you just press the volume button, that clicks the shutter. So I was we were driving down the road, and I actually took quite a few photographs doing that. So this is a photograph I made with an iPad. It was one uh, out of the very first iPad Pro that was out yeah, around sometime 19, 2016. Some other places, though, there are waterfalls like this, and this is not water that's coming uh, from a glacier. Instead, it's coming, just flowing out through the uh, the rock, the, the, the here and there. And every winter, there's some some snow, and then it melts, and this fresh water, and you can tell how nice and blue it is, rather than cloudy like it would be if it came from a glacier, is there. And these are the, uh, the basalt columns. I tried to remember that word a while ago, basalt. They're eight-sided eight octagonal columns that happen whenever uh, the lava crystallizes. There's actually a, one of these out on, in, uh, on the West Coast in the Sierra Nevadas. It's a place called the Devil's Post Pole. And uh, you can go out and walk on the top of them and you see this, this uh, hexagonal six-sided uh, top of the, uh, of the columns. But would you look at the height of this? That's all one lava flow. Can you imagine that much lava flowing at a time? Then it cools and makes these basalt columns and these pop up several places a lot in Iceland. As you move inland, it becomes a desert. Most of Iceland is actually a desert. So we were just starting in inland, our list of photograph is a little ways in, and even here, it's rather rustic. At one time, there was a bridge across here. It's been washed out, and that particular road's no longer used. But then we moved on down and inland, and you get a scene like this. This is what much of the central Iceland looks like. It's a little bit high country, not really that tall, but in a way, and there's uh, all kinds of rocks and so forth. One thing that you counter, and now my wife and I have seen these cairns. A cairn is a pile of rocks like this. It's actually a Scottish word, cairn, and it occur, it's been used back in ancient times by travelers to, to, uh, to mark the path through different areas. And there are actually paths, walking paths up through the central of Iceland. And people have uh, piled up the cairn like this. And of course, uh, the hikers always like to have a, a little game. Who can put the tallest rock 
and make the highest peak up on the Cairn. And my wife and I hiked a lot of trails all over the world, and we, it was just interesting to see how uh, many cairns there were here and there around the world. Oh, this is uh, the couple of the photograph I picked off the internet. Those are the Apollo astronauts before the moon mission in the late 1960s. In two different, several different trips, over 30 of those uh, of our astronauts went to Iceland to practice walking in the in the terrain there because it was the closest to what we speculated the surface of moon would be. So I've got three or four photos here, and as I go through them, I just want you to look at the scenery of how the landscape around where they are. Oops, sorry. Uh, having lunch, but look at the where they are along a, a, a glacier and sitting alongside this area here and see what it's like. Examining a rock to see what it's uh, the, the, how it petrifies or how it cools and what it looks like. And one of the astronauts, I forget which one, says. You know, when I was out walking here, I felt like I was walking on the moon. Of course, he hadn't done so at that time. And, of course, they had to stop and have a little bit of fun out in the countryside, too. Uh, trout fishing here and there uh, is uh, something that goes on in Iceland. So those are a few photos of the Apollo astronauts. Another uh, picture that was made from the side of the, the window of the bus going that 45 miles an hour down the road with my iPad. And I snapped the picture and I think I can show you uh, uh, the, very frequently the mountains are like this, they've eroded down into this flat land and this flat land is where the farming can take place. So all along here there are farmers, this was a little bit larger collection. But I want you to notice the quality of this photo if I can show you now, because this is a farmer out on his four-wheeler out in the field. And that was the quality of a photo you can take with a camera on the back of an iPad. Just another shot or two along the way just to give you an idea of what it's like. And most of the farms are a pretty good size because a small farmer wouldn't make it. There's just not enough land and enough, uh, enough uh, uh, area to, ra to raise very much in the way of uh, farming. It's very uh, hard to, to uh, make a profit and live. Another few other casinos along the road. And another farm. <coughs> and. All of these farms were uh, very uh, modern, clean looking and so forth, and, uh, so it was really interesting to see several of them. Up in the north, though, uh, on one of our trips, we stopped at this building. Like it's a sod building, and I don't know how far back this went. This was a tavern. We actually went inside the tavern and it was open for business. And on the north shore, there is one port where ocean-going ships can come in, and these large ferries come in mostly from Norway, bringing in uh, Europeans, and you can bring your—they can bring their cars in on the ferries and tour around Iceland. So, there's uh, there, it's a pretty active uh, ferry port with uh, large with the large ferries. Then along in the countryside, there's some things that date back quite a few ways. This little small church been there for many many years. Uh, it actually has a family history for Bjorn and his family, and it's just one of the beautiful little places that you can stop, look inside the, the, the chapel and take a, I did take some pictures. And then there are some areas like this, 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 this isn't, doesn't date back, this is a reconstruction just of, like a museum to show you how the, they had to live back in those days, uh, in the cold days, uh, and you use the sod houses and so forth. I took this one up on one on one of the cliffs uh, early on with one of my uh, smaller cameras. It's not the clearest picture, but it's the puffins. But I, they would never let me get close enough, so I stole a picture from somebody else so we could see what the puffin looks like. Growing seasons. 
the summer isn't long enough to grow certain crops. There are no outside farms with tomatoes or corn, but greenhouses are all over and therefore in the restaurants as we have meals on the tour, we have a good selection of vegetables available from the greenhouses. And these uh, tomato vines grow up very tall and uh, we can get these vine grown tomatoes here in the United States. The ones I buy come from Canada. Fishing is one of the main industries, has been for a long time and still is today. It's one of the, fishing is, uh, there's actually three main industries. Fishing, harbors like this on the fjords. It's a rugged life. Uh, the faces of the fishermen I saw showed that they've had some severe weather type things to go as they're out on for weeks at times in the in fishing and then just many other beautiful scenes like this as you go around Iceland one of the farms gives you an idea of a, of the of a, probably about as small a farm as you as you'll see and the other the fishing being number one industry number two is sheep and sheep wool there are more than twice as many sheep in Iceland as there are people. But they don't have uh, pens and fields that they go in. Instead, they go all along that green grass area that I showed you. They mix up, they move for miles all summer long. And then they, uh, in the fall, there is a roundup here and there. Uh, they get rounded up into pens. Each one of them has an identity marker on it. So the owner is, uh, they know who the owner is and he gets credit for that one as it goes to market. I'm sorry, whoops. Ah, sorry, I don't know why this happens. Oh, here we go. The wool, ah, they, you can buy some wonderful wool sweaters and scarves and things like that uh, in Iceland. And the, they have the Iceland horse. It's a native uh, breed. I don't know the or ancient history of it, but it only it's, it's, it occurs there in Iceland. They're small. And some people make the mistake of calling them Iceland ponies. They're not ponies. Uh, at least these are full full grown horses. And they, even though they have a, a common genetic background, they come in all different colors, from blonde mixed to black. Oh, by the way, stay away from the top wire in that fence, so you're likely to get a shock. It's electric. And they take a tour, walk uh, with the horses out to a three, three day uh, ride. And you'll notice uh, there's three people and nine horses because these horses are small and you tire them out riding them. So you take along two spares. And uh, one of the persons in that, uh, in that group Oh, I don't know why I have that. My computer is okay. Okay, sorry. One of the persons has uh, that Jethro Tull T-shirt on. It was just interesting. And then uh, along the road there was a farmer walking his horse, and this young lady was a member of our tour, and she is a ho likes to ride horses. And the, the farmer allowed her to take a little ride on this particular horse. I noticed that blonde color of the horse. And uh, she, the young lady, was 16 at that time. Uh, this is another place of taking photographs up on the high ridges here and there. Uh, this Pete uh, across there with his uh, iPhone uh, and his other camera hanging on, looking down over the shore. And this is just the only, only picture I'll show you of, of, of Bjorn Rurikson. And Bjorn uh, has uh, a beard and mustache here. The last time I saw, he had shaved it off. And uh, this is an earlier picture. As we go as we go around on the tours, there are many places where he takes you. In the backwoods, there's no restaurants, so picnic uh, meals are provided. And he has he has all the food on the on the bus, and we he serves it out in the field. And here is a group of us uh, on a camera uh, photo tour, and uh, you'll notice this person here is where I got a little 
a bucket of something, and that's called skier, and it's uh, an Icelandic yogurt, except it's more concentrated, more protein in it than the American yogurts, and they're very proud of it, and it's also always available in big bowls in the more breakfast on the, at the uh, motels. This is one of the containers. I actually bought this uh, at, at uh, Whole Foods. They, they quit carrying it, but this little package was made in the town of Selfoss in Iceland, and that's Bjorn Rorikson's hometown. It's a small town, relatively small town, about 35 miles outside of Reykjavik. So this is one that came from, from uh, Iceland. They don't have enough uh, fields to have enough cattle to have enough milk to make as much of this as they would like. So very little of it is exported. And nowadays the thing that you can buy is an imitation here in the United States from a color company you've all seen uh, in the stores that they call it Icelandic. And it's, uh, the Icelandic people will say it may not be quite up to quality. This is a photograph from the hotel in Bjorn's hometown of Selfoss. The, the river is uh, about, I think, the largest river there. If you take the tour, uh, this is you will stay a couple of nights here. Uh, Bjorn's house is up on, behind this ridge over here on the right. And this I took from the uh, uh, one of the maps because it shows um, the, uh, the north side of the town. Bjorn's house is over here on the shore of the river. I want you to notice another little small area over here to the right that's, uh, that's marked and, we, and because that's uh, a small church out there in the countryside. And uh, the small church sets like this and out in front is a tombstone. And uh, if the normal tombstones and graves are all at the side, but for some reason there's one right here at the front and it's a very famous person who is buried there by the name of Bobby Fischer, the chess player who beat the Russian guy uh, out champion out in his younger days. That chess match was played in, in Reykjavik and he uh, fell in love with Reykjavik. Later on in life, he had some mental problems and in the last several years of Bobby Fischer's life, he spent in Reykjavik, but he's married, buried out in this small churchyard. Uh, inside the church, in the, up in the attic, is an organ. The organist is Bjorn Rodrickson. He plays the organ, and he said, I think he said he sings in the choir. It's not that big a church. It's a very small church. I did share this uh, church with uh, Google Maps, and uh, Google sent me an email a couple of years ago and said it had been both photos had been viewed over a thousand times as part of Google Maps. Okay, so we've talked about Iceland, the land of ice and fire. And as we leave, oh, I forgot, the Blue Lagoon, the most famous site in Iceland. And I'm afraid the most famous uh, overblown site. When I took this picture with my wife there in 2002, there's a few people out in the Blue Lagoon. The Blue Lagoon is a, a man-made lake in the middle of a lava field. It's uh, about halfway between Reykjavik and the airport that everybody flies in, so it's very handy for tourists. Uh, and But it's developed into a, such a tourist thing that some of the tourist sites will not recommend it very much. In 2017, the company itself reported they had 1.2 million visitors. So that was, uh, the, and here's a more recent shot. And the other reason I show this is because you see the hydroelectric, uh, or not hydro, the, uh, the geothermal thermal plants back here. Geothermal power does about 35 to, or four, close to 40% of the electricity in Iceland. Another larger, slightly larger portion of it comes from hydroelectric from all the waterfalls that, uh, are, that are here and there. So that's a little bit about it. Oh, I couldn't stop without somebody having a MacBook Apple product there. And so I think Pete, I think, gave shot this picture of me uh, as uh, in, uh, there. So I think I'm going to end with that. I'll say goodbye to you. And I want you to... <laughs>
be careful and don't get your feet wet in the water flowing there. So I'm going to stop with this. Uh, I'm going to turn it back out if I can to, uh, uh, to and, and get back to the group. Let's see. So if anybody has any questions, you can either unmute yourself or I'll try to view through the gallery and if you're waving your hand, I'll know you have a question and I'll unmute you. You can also um, go in the chat. Uh, Pete, let's see. I've, I've tried. Hey, I'm un unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just, Bjorn did a fantastic job. I'm Pete Cross, and uh, I spent 30 years traveling with Bjorn Eriksson throughout Iceland starting in 1978. Certainly, the country is different uh, now than it was then. There's uh, uh, 350,000 people in the whole country and about 100,000 in Reykjavik. And what this does is make all decisions very easy to make with a small population all believing in the same good things for Iceland itself. So the government does a great job and they're clean. Their COVID-19 uh, attack was exemplary in the, in the world. And uh, they all speak English, medical care is outstanding, and the food is wonderful. And I just wanted to say just a couple of quick things uh, about, uh, to round out this beautiful presentation. Uh, it, Clay's pictures are just phenomenal in how he put it together. It's wonderful. The, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, 870 AD is about the time when Iceland was settled, and it was settled because the climate was warmer six, seven, eight degrees warmer. There was no ice coming down on the north. It was easy travel. And so the people, Vikings and people from uh, the north of Europe uh, found it very easy to get all the way to Greenland, actually. And the reason that the Greenland people died off was because of the ice coming and the change in the climates. The uh, trips that we began in the set late 70s we had gravel roads everywhere, and all the tour buses had 12-ply tires and were three feet off the ground because you had to ford all the streams, which today have bridges. The ring road you heard about is, uh, is gravel all the way around. And uh, we had the pleasure of one trip of walking on hot lava. You could see the, 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 see the red through it, and you stick a newspaper in there and watch it burn. And it's safe to do that on the kinds of eruptions that uh, occur uh, fairly frequently in Iceland. The uh, Jokul Sarlung, you saw the boats that take you out among the glacier uh, that broke off. That wasn't even there in 1934. It began as the glaciers began to melt back in 35, and it's expanded ever since. It's a, a wonderful trip. And <clears throat> the... Uh, Let's see, is there anything else I mentioned? Uh, Pete, can I ask a question? Somebody yeah. asked while you're talking about glaciers. That's it. I, that's about Has it. Has there been a difference in size of glaciers in between the different visits? I guess that's questions for you. Yes, yeah, very oh. noticeable. Very noticeable. Yes. Just in the time that we've traveled to the, the south coast, uh, the Yokel Sarling, the lake that you saw that you can travel in, in uh, oversized ducks, as they call them. Uh, those, uh, that lake wasn't even available uh, for traveling when we first started out. And then there was another question. I think Clay may have answered this, but um, someone asked if there is much vegetation on Iceland. She didn't seem to see many trees or plants in your... There was, there was one picture that was set up as an advertisement that, that uh, Clay showed, which was the, the, the girl modeling a wool sweater. And behind her were tree trunks, six, eight inches in diameter. Now that's true where they have uh, places they grow trees, but uh, the trees were all taken down. It was well forested long ago, but all, imagine living there, your only building and your only heating supply was wood. And so wood was at a high priority and then the sheep came in and you cannot grow anything unless you fence it off because of the sheep. There were 20 million sheep when we were starting out there and now there are 2 million. 
<laughs> Anybody else have any questions for Bjorn or Pete? I mean, Bjorn Clay or Pete? <laughs> um, we uh, have one from Don. Don? How do we get a copy of the recording or access a copy of the recording? Well, I've recorded it and hopefully our marketing team will upload it to YouTube. So just be on the lookout for it. They're a little behind because we've been doing so many Zoom presentations, but we're trying to get them uploaded to Zoom, uh, YouTube. Excellent. Thank you. Clay, I have uh, one question about fish. When we were there and driving from Reykjavik to Keflavik, there used to be years ago uh, racks along the side of the road that they dried codfish. Did you see any of those? I did no. not uh, personally. No. Petit, you probably have. <laughs> yes, but long ago. Uh, they're not using uh, cod drying racks now. And uh, at one point, the, the cod was the primary export. And Spain was the primary importer many years ago. Thank you. By the way, uh, I, uh, I pick up from uh, Costco some Iceland cod that's frozen there. They actually have packages of a frozen Iceland cod with a miso <laughs> sauce on it. Uh, and Bjorn, on the, by the way, on his, when he uh, schedules our visits to different motels, restaurants, and so forth, he picks the menu. So you don't get the same thing every day. And you really, you really get a good variety of things. Uh, I learned the, the, oh man, some of the fresh caught cod cooked, caught that morning and cooked in uh, the restaurants there and so forth. So it was... Uh, He's, he's a phenomenal guy. The way he sets up his tour, he is meticulous in putting together every little step. But any time he's driving along and something interesting, he'll break you away and take you to it. So, other questions? And he will work as your bank also when you're traveling, which makes it a lot easier and you don't have an exchange rate that's excessive at all. He's very good about that and returns the Iceland uh, and the, the uh, hotels had Wi-Fi and uh, four years ago their Wi-Fi was great and I never I didn't even need a phone service there because I could use what's called Wi-Fi uh, use a Wi-Fi phone and I could call anybody in the United States not internationally free of charge using uh, using just my iPhone and the Wi-Fi in the motels and it was really, uh, every the Wi-Fi was super fast in every motel. And another thing about Iceland is the um, their genetic uh, studies. They've done more genetic studies of their own population, as well as the very first, some of the very first early work with uh, discovering the, the uh, how RNA DNA was made. And they still have a, a, a world renowned uh, place in that in the scientific world. Well, okay. Any other questions? <laughs> I don't see any. I've had some private messages though, Clay, to thank you and they appreciate you doing the presentation. It was very interesting. So well I only had about another thousand photos to show you. <laughs> <laughs> well so if there interested they can come on the trip and see them for themselves so well hopefully yes they will also be back in the uh in the new center and uh, uh do be able to do some things there some of you have uh, seen uh Bjorn. sure <clears throat> the uh the weather uh in the center of the island uh is uh, not passable in the winter time because of the snow it's a high latitude desert that is thousands of square miles of just volcanic gravel. It is an incredible sight to see and you do get a chance to get into part of that. The summertime temperatures, uh, June, July, August, are uh, with breezes constant, you'll have temperatures as anywhere from 45 to 65 and sometimes it gets up 75 rarely. So we advise people when they go over, you have a shell which is waterproof. It doesn't rain like it does here. It mists frequently for an hour or two, and then the sun is out, and then it mists again. And so 
you wear uh, comfortable uh, boots or low shoes that are waterproof and you uh, have a, a, a slicker of some sort unlined depending on the temperatures and I would say certainly wearing vests, uh, all kinds of wool, uh, I mean, uh, fiberglass vests now that are available are excellent. Plus a hat and some gloves for people who have issues with their hands, temperature. How, how long is the, the summer versus the winter? Very long summer or? or... How do you end the summer? <laughs> what, te- <laughs> what do you want for the, what do you want to do as a cutoff? <laughs> well, uh, you know, let's say it gets below freezing. Oh, well, that would be, that would be uh, November. Oh, okay. September, end of August and September are outstanding times. There's uh, less chance of rain and uh, you are getting, as you approach the middle of September, of course, you're getting equal length of days and nights because a lot of people in the summer over there, the sun does, uh, sets maybe at 1130 or 12 at night and comes up at one o'clock. And uh, so the shades are all dark in places where you're sleeping. But I would say certainly uh, the winter time is an excellent time to visit Iceland. The, around the perimeters of, the, of the Iceland, the snow is very marginal. Uh, the temperatures uh, in, the, in the entire southern, southeastern and southwestern coast <clears throat> are somewhere in the 20s and 30s. It's like New York City, New York State. It's uh, with with less snow, so yeah. most people live along the coast. Then, as opposed yes, to definitely. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Okay, I was there in July twice, and at the end of most, uh, it mostly end of September. <clears throat> Oddly enough, I think <clears throat> I only got on twice in a, in six weeks, so I was lucky. <laughs> uh, I spent Christmas with my wife Joy up on the north coast in the town of Akureyri uh, with Bjorn and some of his friends. We were there for Christmas. Now, the sunlight does not hit the center of the town, doesn't hit the streets, it doesn't come up, but it hits the mountains around the uh, city. And the snow on the mountains reflected light into the city and it was very comfortable. You didn't get depressed. It wasn't dark all the time. And uh, you could drive around without any lights. And uh, it would be maybe 9, 30, 10, to maybe three o'clock in the afternoon, then it starts to get dark again. But the temperature was 20s to 30s and a little bit of slush on the road. And the town is, Akureyri is a very lively, delightful place. It is the capital of the North, as they call it. It's a very pleasant town. So uh, Pete, how many times have you been there? And and Clay, how many times have you been there? Three for me. And I would say 10 to 12 at least. Um, we, Bjorn and I set up a pattern where I would g- obtain a group of people from a museum uh, or from an alumni society and uh, I would set the trip up and then he would lead the trip with me. The two of us just love to work together. We get along so well. Mm. And <clears throat> that was really uh, the way we found this 30-year friendship working so well. The uh, it was every two or three years I would do that. It was obviously not my main job. It was something I was able to do because uh, I was in teaching and in museum leadership for a while. The Northern Lights, we didn't mention it, but they popped up a little bit in uh, the second week in September when I was there. And uh, but uh, from then on, uh, it's likely to get a good show of the Northern Lights. <laughs> Yeah, you can never can tell when, as Clay said, the end of August on. Uh, in our last trip over there, <laughs> that we had some eager beaver young people that were there. That they were going to capture the sunsets late, <laughs> and they were going to capture <laughs> they were going to capture all the bright lights later on in the sky, and uh, they would never sleep. And it took about two days for them to realize this pattern of living on the trip was not appropriate. <laughs> So they had to make some decisions because there's so much going on in the sky. Hmm. Any other questions? Well, thank everyone. Thank you, Clay, very much for all the work you put into your presentation and Pete for adding your 
um, knowledge to the presentation as well. And we hope you'll come join us next year. We have a few spaces available. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Great. Good to see you all. Yeah, nice to see you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.